Welcome to episode 46 of FBI Retired Case File Review with Jerry Williams. I'm a retired agent writing crime fiction inspired by actual FBI cases. In this episode, we get to speak to retired agent Joe Pistone. Now, Joe served in the FBI for nearly 27 years. However, he is primarily known worldwide for the six years he spent infiltrating one of the New York Mafia families as Donnie Brasco, his undercover alter ego. This was a mission so secret, only a handful of agents in the FBI knew what Joe Pistone was doing and where he was as he secretly gathered vital intelligence on the mafia and its criminal ways. The work Joe Pistone did was so incredibly dangerous that it has been documented in numerous books, documentaries, television shows, and the 1997 feature film, Donnie Brasco, starring Johnny Depp and Al Pacino. Once the undercover assignment was closed down, Joe spent the remainder of his bureau career testifying in federal court all over the country for mob-related trials and at the FBI Academy, helping to establish the FBI's undercover program and training courses. Joe continues to this day to travel overseas lecturing and training law enforcement officers how to go undercover. I want to thank my FBI classmate, John Legata, episode 21, for connecting me with Joe Pistone. I emailed John and I said, do you think Joe, who he worked with undercover for a number of years, would do the podcast? And he emailed me back. He said, Joe said, yes, he's going to give you a call. And Joe called. He was gracious. He was generous. We spoke for over an hour and I am just thrilled. I could die right now and go to podcaster heaven based on this interview. The only other interview that I aspire to after this is interviewing former FBI director Louis Free. So I'll keep working on that one too. Joe Pistone is an FBI legend And the fact that he was willing to take time out of his day to do this interview is absolutely, I I, I don't have words for how excited I am to, to share this interview with you. But before I do that, if you are listening to this before December 14th, 2016, I want to make you aware of FBI Live Facebook event on FBI Women Special Agents. During this Facebook Live event, FBI personnel will be exploring how women bring unique experiences and perspectives to the special agent position. You'll be able to type in your comments and your questions in real time and get those answered on Facebook, Wednesday, December 14th, 2016 at 3 p.m. Eastern time, 12 p.m. specific time. So if you are interested in joining the FBI or you have a daughter, a sister, a spouse, a girlfriend, a neighbor, a coworker, who you think would be an ideal candidate, make sure they know about this Facebook Live event on women in the FBI. If you need more details, there's a flyer, and I have posted the flyer both on my Facebook author page, Jerry Williams Author, and on Twitter, Jerry Williams One. And talking about women in the FBI, pay to play my crime novel about a female FBI agent investigating corruption in the Philadelphia strip club industry is still doing great. I have a new five-star review, which reads, very enjoyable, perfect combination of gritty reality and slick storytelling. Highly recommend. And that's from an Amazon customer. So dear Amazon customer, thank you so much for that review. I have 39 reviews at this date. I would love to get to 50 by the end of the year. So I know you have the book. I know you're reading it. And if you've enjoyed it, please don't forget to write your review. It could just be a couple of sentences so that other readers learn about pay to play. Now here's the show. 
Hi, everyone. I am absolutely excited to introduce you to my guest, Joe Pistone. Hey, Joe, how are you? Fine. Thank you, Jerry. It's a pleasure speaking with you. Oh, I am so thrilled. One of the things that uh, I do in this podcast is try to answer, uh, you know, some of the myths about the FBI. Because, you know, in books and movies and TVs, they try to make it, you know, over the top. And it's already pretty cool. But, you know, there's some things that they take a creative license for. So I like to pull back the curtain and kind of show people behind the scenes to be able to talk to you about your undercover activities and to kind of look at what really happened and what the movie got wrong and, you know, what your books get right. So thank you for being here. Well, thank you for having me on. It's my pleasure. Well, I always start the same way. I ask the agents, the retired agents that I'm talking to, to take me from the very beginning and, and tell me why they joined the FBI and when they joined the FBI. So what was your interest? You know, why did why did you want to be a special agent? Well, I always wanted to be in, in, in law enforcement and uh uh of course you know your first your first inclination is to be a police officer and uh I actually I was a senior in college and I did take the exam for the police department and passed it. But then when I was advised that uh, I had to go to uh, a rookie school, uh, I would have had to drop out of college. So uh, that wasn't uh, that wasn't any hard decision because I, you know, I'm in my last year and I didn't want to drop out. So I stayed in, and when I got out of college, I went into naval intelligence and uh, worked uh, in. Uh, as a special agent with Naval Intelligence, and during my uh, time with Naval Intelligence, I worked closely with uh, FBI agents, and uh, I was actually recruited uh, by uh, agents of the FBI that I that I was working with. Uh, but during the, the period of that time, I had taken the the test for. Uh, DEA, which was actually uh, back then the Bureau of Narcotics and Dangerous Drugs, and uh, and I took the test for the FBI, and the FBI called first, so that's how I got uh, into the FBI, and I'm proud to say that I, that, uh, I worked under Mr. Hoover, so that's how long ago that, uh, <laughs> that, I, that I entered the FBI. Uh, so, but that, that's basically it. And, um, uh, where, you know, where are you from? I'm from Patterson, New Jersey. Okay. And, you know, I grew up in a, uh, an all Italian neighborhood. So, you know, I, 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 I didn't grow up with a silver spoon in my mouth, so to speak. I knew the way of the streets and, uh, had some street smarts, you know, growing up, uh, that I acquired and they carried over into my, uh, my career as a uh, in naval intelligence and then uh, in, into the FBI. So I guess it, it was recognized early on that uh, uh, that I you know I turned out to be a pretty good investigator because of my you know my growing up and my street smarts and uh, was asked if I wanted to do a couple undercover investigations early on in my career and I I uh, I did. And uh, it just took off from there. Did you ever work anything else? Uh, were you always directed into organized crime? Well, in my in in my first office, which was Jacksonville, Florida, I worked uh, all criminal uh, uh, violations. I worked bank robberies, fugitives. Uh, it, it most of my most of my investigative experience was. In, in the field of uh, organized crime, when I say that, I mean you know gambling, uh, gambling cases, prostitution cases, bank robbery cases where the the bank robberies were actually bank burglaries carried out out by uh, by gangs. So I, I, I never really worked any any national security cases, uh, except when I was in, in, in naval intelligence that I worked some national security cases. But in the FBI, it was all basic uh, criminal. Uh, I was a criminal agent. 
So how far into your career did you start doing this undercover? Well, <laughs> actually, which I I really don't recommend, um, my first year with the wow. FBI, I started doing uh, undercover cases, in, um, and these were basically um, gambling cases where I would uh, go into gambling gambling dens, uh, and uh, because uh, again, uh, before I, you know, before I went into naval intelligence and the FBI. Uh, I, I did a little gambling in my day from in the neighborhood, you know, so I, <laughs> I knew about gambling. So, and also, uh, uh, back in, uh, back in the day, uh, local prostitution rings were big, uh, down south. And as I said, my first office was Jacksonville, Florida. So I, uh, uh, some of the cases were attempting to infiltrate the uh, the pimps that were uh, prostituting the uh, the ladies. So actually, uh, Jerry, yeah, early on in my career, I, I would say my first year in the FBI, I started doing, you know, and, and, and these were all short term operations. And then later on, I, uh, I got into long term operations. When I say long term, I'm talking like six months, uh, a year. And then, of course, I got into uh, the six-year operation uh, when I infiltrated the mafia in, in New York City. Yeah. Well, you know, the people that listen to this podcast are pretty sophisticated. They're pretty informed um, mm -hmm. because they've been listening. I've done, I think this is going to be my 46th uh, interview. So they've heard from different agents who have worked undercover. And the ones that have worked undercover Later, and and you know, in their careers, you know, talk about training and going to undercover school and and meeting with a psychologist to you know assess you know what's going on um, you know in their in their mind. None of that existed when you did this, right? No, none of it existed. We had no actually, we had no real undercover program back back in the day, and it was basically you know any undercover case was basically run out of the field office. And then later, you know, later on, I, I would say uh, maybe around 72, maybe 73, we had one individual at headquarters by the name of uh, uh, Bob Lill, uh, who was a terrific, terrific individual, great FBI agent. And uh, he was involved in a the first big sting operation where we opened up when I say we I'm talking about the FBI and Bob was uh was the coordinator of it uh at a Washington field office they opened up uh, a business a, a fencing business uh where they were buying all stolen uh articles and uh commodities from uh from street uh, thieves and uh, from there, that's when, you know, headquarters, FBI headquarters finally realized that uh, that this was a good investigative tool. So Bob went to headquarters and he was the only uh, individual that would that started to coordinate between offices, undercover operations. And then eventually, you know, as time went on uh, and the FBI sort of success in undercover operations that they expanded uh, Bob's role at, at headquarters and, and brought in a few a few more agents and uh, and uh, made it in, in, into a, a solid unit there. Uh, but we still had no training. And then uh, <clears throat> there was an uh, an individual by the name of Joe Yablonski uh, who was a, a great undercover agent. And Joe Joe's uh, field was uh, was stolen art and 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 and, um, and stocks and bonds, and uh, he he got together uh, and uh, brought several of us that probably were about twenty twenty of us throughout the country that were doing the, uh, undercover operations, and he brought us down to uh, Quantico, and we sat down for. For like a week at Quantico and just uh, 
kicked around, you know, well, what did you do on uh, on this case? Well, I did A, B, and C. You know, well, how did you infiltrate uh, this group? Well, I did, you know, A, B, and C. And that basically was the uh, was the beginning of, of, of the program. But we still had no training courses. When I I finished my six year uh, operation, undercover operation, back in uh, eighty two, uh, what we what we started doing was uh, bringing agents in for a week, and uh, again doing you know not not really a training, but having other undercover agents come in and and speak to these prospective undercover agents. Uh, and then that 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 evolved into the thing that I'm proud of uh, my career that I, that uh, I was one of the originators of the uh, FBI's undercover program where undercovers who pass a psychological testing and and uh, interviewing get to go to a two week intense undercover school where they're given uh, lectures on how to infiltrate, et cetera, et cetera, and actually do scenarios where they're uh, critiqued on these scenarios. And that, 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 like I say, that is an intense two-week undercover program, which is uh, which is very beneficial. And it, it actually it turned out that, it, you know, it was such a beneficial and well-renowned program that other other countries actually instituted it because what we would do once we got the program started we would invite uh, uh, people from other countries that were involved in undercover operations to sit in on the two weeks and observe it. And they went back to their countries and, and instituted the uh, uh, the methods that we used in, in our two-week school. And we also uh, brought on psychologists. You know, we we have FBI agents that, that have degrees in psychology, so... Uh, and were practicing psychologists before they came in the bureau. So we, you know, we brought them on, and uh, it, it's really a great program in that that the welfare of the undercover agent is is looked out for at, at every step of the investigation, as far as uh, meeting with the psychologist and uh, and talking out, you know, whatever concerns that they have. Well, let me ask you this, because you said something about, you know, undercover being selected. So I know there's an assessment. Can you tell us what you're looking for when when someone is being assessed to see if they can do undercover work? What are the key things that they should have or should be able to handle? Well, I always look for flexibility in, in the individual. I look for common sense, you know. Because that, that's basically you have to have good common sense in, in, in anything. But uh, I look for somebody with with good so- common sense, and w- what I basically looked for was somebody that was a good investigator prior. You know, to be a good undercover, you have to be a good investigator. But just because you're a good investigator doesn't mean you were going to be a good undercover. If that makes any sense to you. Oh, it does. It does. And. Uh, what about that, acting and role playing? Um, are you looking for somebody who can can do that? Is that part of it? Well, you know, I always, you know, people say to me, "Boy, you must have been a heck of an actor." Well, you know, you have to be natural because you know what I always answer is, "Look, you know, when you're acting, you're 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 reacting off somebody else's conversation." But when you're in an undercover role, you don't know where this conversation is coming from. So you can't act on it. You know what I You have to be natural. Uh, you have to be natural in your conversations. You have to be able to... A big part of undercover is communications. You have to be able to communicate orally with with an individual. And like I say, an actor, you know, an actor reacts off the... The person that they're going on one on one with, or their com, you know, their last words in their conversation, and they they know what those words are. But in an undercover role, you don't know what the conversation is going to be prior to going into it. Hmm. Uh, so that's why I always say, you know, I'm looking for somebody that 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 has common sense, somebody that that, that naturally. Uh, 
has no problem in a, in a conversation, someone who can react to the situation quick on their feet, so to say. And, and, and again, I always say, I, I don't want to work with somebody that sweats. <laughs> you know, <laughs> if in a situation my partner's sweating, that's the last time I'm going to be a partner with that person. Never let them see you sweat. <laughs> that's exactly right. <clears throat> but uh, I, I, I have to, you know, like I say, I, I have, I have taught undercover schools all over the U.S. and in, in, in many foreign countries. And the, the, the FBI by far uh, put together the best program for undercover agents from the selection process to the uh, uh, two-week school. And, you know, just because you, you, you get into the two-week school doesn't mean you finish it. Uh, oh, really? So people fail? Why would they yeah. fail? Well, because they, again, they sweat. When it comes to this, when it comes to the scenarios, they, you know, lack of a better term, they start sweating, or they can't, they they can't keep up the conversation because in the scenarios, you know, you may, the, you know, the perspective undercover may be going one on one, one on two, you know, one on three with bad guys. That's the way the scenario is set up. So and and like every student is is critiqued after you know during the scenarios and after the scenarios so and again just because you're selected doesn't mean you you know you're going to make it and just because uh, again you were or are a good investigator doesn't mean you're going to be a good undercover there's that, that that extra sense that's that that person has in them that that makes them stand out from the others where they can do the they can do the job. Mm. Mm. Well, let's talk a little bit about your six years because when you did this, none of this was in place. I mean, I guess deep inside you knew you could do it, but the people who selected you to go undercover to infiltrate the, the mafia they were just guessing that uh, you would be good at this. So why why did they choose you? Why you? Well, I I, I, I was in uh, New York and I, I I just come off a year and a half undercover operation where I I had infiltrated a uh, a gang of thieves that was operating uh, up and down the East Coast, uh, stealing high priced uh, vehicles and. So when I, you know, when I was successful and I was fortunate enough again, you know, to be successful in all my other undercover operations that I was involved in. And when I, you know, when I got back to New York, I, I had a, a great supervisor by the name of Guy Barato, uh, who was thinking about starting an undercover operation to, uh, see, you know, to infiltrate actually fences that were dealing with the mafia, uh, in, in in all the stolen commodities and properties that the that the mob guys were uh, were 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 doing. So uh, when you started this thing, the intention was not for you to get as far as you got. That was like a a, a surprise. Yeah, the, the the intention was actually to infiltrate the fences. Uh, that you know, and, and and for your audience, you know, fences are individuals that that buy stolen property and then. And then resell it. Uh, and these fences were 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 the fences for the mafia. They were they were buying this stolen property from the mafia and then and then reselling it. <clears throat> and that was the intention. And it was scheduled for for a six month operation. Fortunately, uh, I was able to to bypass the fences and met some mafia guys. And uh, started hanging around with with them. I mean, you know, it, it, it's a it's a long it's a long story. It, it you know, it, it took me six six or seven months to to actually start talking to anybody uh, uh, and and make any headway because you know with, with with the Italian mafia you just don't walk in and say hey I'm Donnie Brasco I want to you know I want to deal with you. When I did make contact with the mob guys and, and, and convince them 
that I was, and my profession was a jewel thief. I, I was a, a professional jewel thief. That's what my profession, my criminal profession was. Okay. What was amazing about it is that, you know, these guys, when I say these guys, the mafia guys, everybody knows everybody uh, within their circle or they have the ability to, you know, uh, a mob guy in, in, in Manhattan has the ability to reach out to a mob guy in Brooklyn and say, hey, do you know Donnie Brasco? So I could not say I was from anywhere in New York because they, they could have checked that out. Right. So, uh, again, what you do is, uh, and uh, you know, uh, I'm not going to give away any secrets, but you have to have a legend. You have to co- come from somewhere. And the basic thing is, is you have to know your enemy. Uh, you have to know everything about your enemy. And what I do is I, all my undercover classes, I I instruct them to read The Art of War. Mm. It's, a, it's a book written thousands of years ago. And uh, in this book, it tells you how to how to defeat your enemy, what you need to do. And, 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 and actually, you know, it's used today in a lot of military circles. And I instruct all my students to read that uh, <clears throat> because you can't defeat your enemy unless you know your enemy. And um, uh, you have to know everything about them before you decide what your uh, legend is going to be. So, for an example, right? I grew up Italian, so I I, I pretty much know the Italian, you know, uh, how Italians think and, and, and how, uh, and especially the mafia. Italians are very family orientated not only the, the mafia family but you know with with their blood relatives so we knew that in, in these circles uh i i could not say that that that, that i was married uh that i had children uh that I had any any relatives that i knew of because if i was fortunate enough to get into that step i would have had a bring somebody around. I would have to introduce somebody. So my legend was I was an orphan. Hmm. Uh, an orphan from? An, an, an orphan that I uh, grew up in an orphanage that uh, left the orphanage when I was like 16, but the orphanage had burnt down. So we found an orphanage that uh, that had burnt down and there were no records uh, available. Wow. Uh, so that basically was, you know, and I had a, you know, I had to convince them and, and that I was Italian, you know, going by, by my last name, but because I, I, knowing the culture and everything, so that that's you know, uh, that's how that that's how I uh, I convinced them uh, that you know of my backstory of, of my legend. There's there's a lot there's a lot that goes into the making of an undercover agent and an undercover case that you don't see in the movies or you don't see on television. Can we talk about your choice of name, Donnie Brasco? Because <laughs> <laughs> you know I know the story behind that. <laughs> I I'd rather just say that uh, it's a name that I. That rang a good bell for me, and I like the sound of it. <laughs> All right. Well, I know the true story. Would you rather me not? Uh, uh, yes, I it? would. Okay. Yeah, I, I don't want to put anybody out of spot. Okay. Sorry, listeners. Um, <laughs> I, I wish I could tell you this story because it is so wild. But um, Joe says I can't, so I won't. <laughs> but... but uh, <laughs> Yeah, there's, like I said, there's more that there's more that goes into the making of a of, of a good undercover and a case than you know than you see on television or or, or in a full length movie. If you can give us four or five sentences that we need to know before we go further about the mafia in New York and what your initial goal was once once you did see that you were having this connection, where did where were you hoping to take this? During, during the day, the mafia in New York consisted of uh, of uh, five major families, and, and basically, the mafia, the, the we're talking about the Italian mafia, is it, it, a group of uh, individuals 
that are all of Italian descent. For your listeners, the mafia is not an equal opportunity employer. And what I mean by that is a white male and Italian to become a member of, of the American mafia. And you become you, a you, member. Uh, you mean like I have no, ch- I have no chance. No, I, unfortunately you've got a couple of <laughs> strikes against you, <laughs> but, uh, uh, they will do business with you. Uh, they'll do business with anybody that, that makes them money. So, okay. but, but right. to, you know, when I say become a mem- member, be- to be inducted into a mafia family, you got to be white, male, and Italian. And basically, during the day, the mafia controlled uh, all interstate commerce in the United States. Uh, there wasn't anything that they didn't control. They, you know, as far as uh, uh, politicians, uh, judges, law enforcement, uh, uh, labor unions, they were they were the power uh, structure as far as organized crime. And uh, basically, once I, like I say, you know, it, it took me six or seven months in order to to really uh, get involved with with anybody of any consequence. Uh, but once I did, uh, then of course the you know the powers to be said, hey, you know, we've never had that, anything like this before, as far as. Uh, uh, any any undercover dealing with with you know with mafia guys of, of this consequence. So now now the the focus was away from the fences and dealing strictly with the with the main mafia guys. Oh. Uh, and, and I was fortunate enough to uh, uh, actually the first family that I that I infiltrated was the uh, the Colombo uh, mafia Colombo. Colombo family, uh, and, and I hung out with with, uh, with these guys in, in, in Brooklyn. Uh, <clears throat> and then uh, after several months with them, I uh, I hooked up with a, uh, an individual uh, by the name of Tony Mira, who was a, a Bonanno, a member of the Bonanno uh, crime family, and uh, he was uh, out of uh, Little Italy. So I start hanging out with him in Little Italy. Uh, he introduced me to another individual, uh, another Bonanno Mafia guy by the name of uh, Lefty Ruggiero, and I, I became really close with him. Uh, Tony Mira went went back. He he was uh, he, he had just got out of jail, and then he went back to jail. So I became very close with uh, with uh, Ruggiero and. Uh, through Ruggiero, I became close to uh, uh, the individual, uh, several high-ranking individuals of the Bonanno family, uh, <clears throat> and they took a liking to me. And uh, uh, I, I was able to, during the course of this this investigation, Jerry, which is uh, is not you don't read about this much, but I, I was able to marry the Bonanno crime family with a crime family in Milwaukee called the Balistrieri crime uh, mafia family hmm. to, to, to do business. And, and why, did, also, why was that important to do that? Well, because, you know, we're mail we're, we're, we're marrying a mafia family from New York with a mafia family in Milwaukee to conduct an illegal activity. And that was through, uh, we had an under, when I say we, you know, I'm talking about the FBI had an undercover operation going in Milwaukee, mm. uh, against the, uh, the mafia there. And, uh, <clears throat> it was thought, well, let's see if we can get these two families together, uh, to conduct illegal business. Uh, and, and, and I did. And, and again, you know, you have to know the workings of the mafia, how they they, they operate, uh, because one one family can't go into another family's territory without permission. So this took several months, but but we did it. Uh, and then later on, uh, the FBI had another undercover cover operation going in in Florida. I was able to engineer another marriage between the Bonanos and the Traficanti uh, mafia family. Uh, in, in Florida, 
uh, and what this did, this was this, this was great for our intelligence in that we 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 were able to determine how the mafia works uh, throughout the country, how they they deal with each other, uh, what procedures have to be taken for one one mafia family to to operate in another mafia family's territory, and I also during this during the course of this were uh, was able to identify mafia members uh, that we you know we hadn't identified prior, and, and what uh, other illegal activities they were involved in, and uh, unfortunately uh, was able to ad- identify. Uh, individuals that uh, uh, they were paying off as far as uh, uh, law enforcement officials and uh, politicians. Wow. So it, w- it was a, a, a great trove of intelligence information besides being an investigation that was uh, uh, very instrumental in, in uh, charging these individuals with criminal violations. Well, let me ask you about that because, I mean, that takes evidence. How were you recording this? I mean, were you doing FD302s? Were you doing, you know, inserts and having a file? How was all of this being recorded as evidence? I had an individual, uh, an FBI agent, who uh, I would uh, call on the telephone. How often? well, whenever I had information of, of, of evidentiary value or information that was of intelligence. Uh, so, it, it uh, again, it all depended on uh, how much information I had. Or I would I would meet this individual, say, at the uh, Museum of Natural History in New York or the, the big uh, New York City library. Because, fortunately, most of my guys weren't visiting the Museum of Natural History or... or <laughs> the library and I would just regurgitate to him this information and then he would reduce it to as you said a, a 302 or a memo or an insert uh, depending on what the information was so you have to remember having so many conversations on one day the the only conversations I I trained myself to really focus on were ones that I knew were of evidentiary value uh, or of intelligence information that that I didn't think that that we had. So during this six-year period, how many times did you go into the office? None. Wow. None. Uh, My only meeting uh, was with one or two individuals, uh, FBI agents that, um, uh, that I would give this information to. But I, that, that, I never went into an FBI office during that, that six-year that six period. All right. And what about your family? I know, you know, I, I watched the movie. As a matter, matter of fact, I watched it again last night. Mm-hmm. Um, what about your family? How many times did you actually, you know, go home and meet with your family? Yeah, unlike the movie. If, uh, yeah, that didn't seem real, so that's why I'm asking. Yeah. That the the uh, uh, and I'll tell you why they, they made it that way. Uh, my family, I I had an apartment in, in in New York City, and and one in Florida, and my family actually lived uh, out in the Midwest. So uh, any contact with my family was was via telephone, or I would get home maybe once every six or seven months uh, for a day or two. Wow. Um, That is an unbelievable personal sacrifice that you made for this investigation. I didn't realize that. Yeah. And, you know, like you say, if you saw the movie, it showed me going home, you know, maybe once or or twice a week. And the the reason that was is that they had they had to show that that the hero had when I say, you know, right. I know. I know what you mean. I'm using, you know, their terms had some type of feelings for his family because of of all the bad things he was supposedly doing with the bad guys. You know what I mean? Right. Follow what I'm saying? Right. Um, 
They have the to audience, make the hero likable. Right. The audience had to like the hero. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Uh and and basically that 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 was, you know, uh and what was not uh true in the movie <laughs> and and uh I always make sure I get this out when I do interviews or anything. I I, I never slap my wife. That yeah, was... you know what? I was gonna ask you that because <laughs> and I and I figured that you'd want to get that out because, you know, that's at yeah. the very end. And I thought, you know, yeah. if he wants to yeah. set anything straight, I am sure he wants to set that straight. Yeah, exactly. Uh, that, in fact, uh, that was not in the original script. And the director put that in on the day of shooting. Uh, Were you there? Yes, I was. And when I found that out, I... I uh <clears throat> I had some choice words for the director. Uh we actually uh interrupted shooting for a few hours. Uh but unfortunately uh you know the director's like the captain of the ship and what what he says, you know, uh what he says goes and I I could not convince him that uh uh, that that shouldn't be in there, so I lost that one. And also, I had no bag worth with three th- with three hundred thousand dollars in it. Yeah, yeah. Both <laughs> both of those, as I'm watching it, because you know you were feeling for you, the character, yeah. and then when yeah. that happened, it was like oh, they dirtied it up. Why did they need to yeah. dirty it up? Yeah. Well, yeah. you know, it's 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 the movie, so. Okay. Uh, well, did you cut up a body? No, that's the other thing too. <laughs> Actually, they, they did cut that 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 gentleman up, but they 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 cut him up with a with a chainsaw, not a hacksaw. <laughs> and you weren't there. No, huh? No. Okay. Okay. Also, I think the value of the operation was not only all the convictions, uh, but it showed that the mafia uh, could be penetrated, and the the violence uh, within the organization itself. Which you know, uh, most people have this romantic image of, of the mafia, uh, and th- this showed that you know there's no romance there. I mean, they they kill each other. If there's any if there's any saving grace with <laughs> with the American mafia, they generally don't kill citizens. You know, any mm-hmm. anybody that they kill is is uh, either their own or an individual that, that that is dealing in illegal activities with them that screwed him in some way. But, uh, again, our case, I'm proud to say, is that in every mafia case, basically, that that followed, information from our case was involved in in, in the affidavits for for most of these other big mafia cases. Uh, And that was the beginning of the downfall of of the mafia in in the United States anyway. I mean, uh, as you know, it's it's not as strong as it was back in the day, you know. Today it's, it, yeah, you know, is it a criminal organization? Yes, uh, they don't control the politicians anymore, or or, or law enforcement, or uh, you know, or the major labor unions. You know, they they may have a labor union here or there, but they don't control the major labor unions like they once did, and control interstate commerce like they once did. Yeah. So. With me um, being in the Philly office and being in this Philly area for, for 30 years, mm-hmm. I've definitely seen, you know, the demise of the Philadelphia mob, you know, the FBI here with the Philadelphia Police Department and New Jersey and Pennsylvania State Police have mm-hmm. really done a job on them. Oh, yeah, yeah. I mean, all, all law enforcement has. I mean, you know, I, I don't mean just to say the FBI, but all law enforcement has really, you know, put a damper on, on them. And, you know, to me, you know, like I say, I'm still involved. And when I say still involved, because I still, you know, I still do lectures and, 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 and deal with, uh, with, uh, police agencies that, you know, it, it, it's a criminal organization and that's it. I mean, all the resources aren't on the mafia anymore. You know, they're more concerned about the, about the, the Russians, the Albanians and, you know, these, these organizations, uh, than they are the the American mafia. Mm. Mm. Now, definitely, it was romanticized, um, but you know uh, the truth. 
you know, uh, uh, that it isn't as, as, you know, cool and, 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 you know, romantic as, as they make it appear on TV. What did you think yeah, about you, The Sopranos? What? Did you ever watch that? Yeah, I, I watched a few episodes and, you know, uh, to me, The Sopranos, it, it showed how, how violent they are and, and the treachery within, within each, each group. I mean, you know, and the jealousy and the envy, um, that, that, that takes place within these groups. Now, you know, the boss going to a psychiatrist, uh, that wouldn't last too long in the real world. But, uh, everything else, it, you know, it, it, it really showed the, the the down and gritty uh, lifestyle. You know what what amazed me is how these guys. You know, every day you wake up, and the, the two thoughts are, are are in their in their head: is today the day I get arrested, or is it today the day I get killed? Oh. <laughs> well, know. let me ask you this: when you were <clears throat> undercover, of course, you didn't have to worry about the arrest part. But well, I did. Yeah, you... <laughs> yeah, you do because you're going to get arrested with these guys, you know. So. Okay. But I know what you mean. But you know. Uh, but did, were you worried about is this the day I'm going to get killed? Was that a part of your? Psyche? Oh, sure, sure. Because once you're identified with these guys, the opposition. When I say the opposition, it, there's always jealousy and, and envy, you know. And and once you're you're identified, being with a certain element, I mean it. it, it if there's, you know, if there's a plot against that element, you're, you know, you're involved in it. I mean, I, I was identified by the uh, organized crime squad of, of the New York City Police Department as being a, a member of the Bonanno crime family because, oh. you know, we we did not we did not involve any other agencies, police agencies in, in this investigation. We did not involve all... FBI officers of the, of the investigation. I mean, it was held to a very tight group of individuals on, on a need to know. So after it was over, we found out that you know that I was on the record with the with the NYPD as an organized crime member, oh. and and also during the course of this investigation, th there were two factions within the Bonanno family, and, and if you saw the movie. I mean, those murders took place. Uh, the side I was on uh, murdered the three individuals that wanted to take over the family. And when, when that happened, I was given a contract to kill an individual that didn't show up for that meeting. Obviously, I, you know, I didn't kill him because uh, he, he, he went on the lam, he went on the run because he knew that the contract was out on him. But that was the only time during this investigation that I carried a, a gun. That gun was given to me by the bad guys because now there's a shooting war. And that's basically the reason that, that we ended the operation was because of the shooting war within the Bonanno family. For two reasons, I take it. One, to make sure you're safe and also to end that. I mean, once exactly. you take everybody exactly. down, right? Yeah. Wow. I mean, we, you know, we had, we, we had so much, uh, evidence of criminal activities and we had so much uh, intelligence that, that I had uh, identified members of other families, me you know, members, more members in the Bonanno family, the upper echelon of, of different families who were running the families. And then again, you know, this, this shooting war was going on, so we couldn't continue because I was getting knowledge of who, you know, who was going to get killed. And then again, you know, I was targeted by the opposition. So that, that's why we, 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 uh, we terminated the, uh, the undercover operation. Well, let me ask you about this. And I'm sure people have asked you this question, you know, over the years, post-traumatic stress. Did you feel that you suffered that? Did you experience any of that? You know, Jerry, I never did. And I'll tell you why, because... The, the one thing that I preach to undercover agents is you have to be yourself. Don't try to be another personality. A, a lot of a, a lot of uh, undercovers they have a misconception of what bad guys are like, 
And this mis- misconception comes from television and the movies. You're right, tough guy. You, exactly. Never change your personality because you can't. Because y- y- you develop problems when you try to be personality A with the bad guys, and then go back to if, if you're just a personality B. Uh, and 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 I never did. I just was me. I did what I did. I I never I never cut out going to the gym. I never cut out going to the movies. So I kept that part of you know that part of my prior life active. So I, I didn't lose my personality uh in that and a lot of guys think, well, geez, you know, if I go to the gym, these guys are gonna think something's wrong with me. If I go to the movies, you know, and I, hey, I'm going to the gym. You know, they, they know that I would like to work out. I mean, who cares? Mm-hmm. They knew that I liked the movies. You come right up front. Hey, you know, I'm going to the movies this afternoon. Anybody want to come? Or I'm going to movies tonight. <laughs> because in in everybody's world, everybody has a life. That, that's and, you, the, and you just stuck to your life, so you didn't have to. Uh, that's it. Come up that's with it. I, I just was who I was. Um, well, I take it there are people, and and you would know this, having worked in the undercover program after, you know, your your uh, your activities. But I, I take it, you know, there are agents who do lose themselves. Yes, you, you you're definitely right, and we find out because they do they do change their their personalities and try to you know try to be tough guys or. You know, or think that this is the way this is the way bad guys all bad guys act. Bad guys don't go to the gym. Bad guys don't run. Bad guys don't don't go to movies. Uh, and you know, you, you have to you have to get involved in in different things besides illegal activities. Talk about sports. Talk about politics because they do. You know, that, that, that's the important thing. Is is is, is you have to be yourself. And um, now, do, do you see things that you don't normally see? Yeah, you know. But you have to have the ability to stay focused on the task at hand. Why, why am I here? Well, I'm here because I'm an FBI agent and I'm on an investigation. And it just so happens that the investigation entails undercover. Uh, and, and, and that's it. I'm not, you know, I'm not a social worker. I'm not here to rehab anybody. My job is not to is not to rehab them. Well, if they're breaking the law, my job is to gather to gather the evidence and let the courts then decide what they're going to do with them. All right, you say that, but you can't help but develop real relationships over a six year period. You're dealing you, with these you, people. You are you are one hundred percent right. All right. So, what happens at the end when you know? Well, you that's have- why I say. That's why I say, you have to be able. You stay yourself. You have to be able to maintain focus on your task at hand, and you have to remember that these guys were 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 gangsters before you got there. I had nothing to do, or or any undercover has nothing to do with them being thieves or gangsters. That was their choice. That was their choice. You you did not, as an undercover, make the choice for them to be a thief or a gangster or whatever criminal activities they're, they're involved in. And yet, you have to maintain that focus throughout the whole investigation. Now, and and let me say this to you. That's mm-hmm. why you know. Uh, <clears throat> that's why there aren't many, there aren't many undercover operations that go this long. There aren't many undercover operations where the undercover agent immerses him or herself into the criminal organization. Remember, during this time, this was this was my whole life was social and criminal. You know what I'm saying? Is that 
this is who y- you you are associated with now, and and that's why there aren't many individuals that can do deep long term undercover operations, because deep undercover means you are undercover. You don't have your badge, you don't have your gun, you don't have an office to go back to. You are immersed and in the life of the criminal group that you have infiltrated. Your only contact with your organization is just one or two individuals that you may see once every, you know, once a week or every couple of weeks to, to provide them with 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 information it all it all comes down to a mental toughness and a lot of people have mental toughness but and, and you know i'm not saying this because it's me because you know i got you know you got steve Salmary, you got you know uh you got john legata you got guys that, that that did it but you can count on your one on your one hand probably how many out of the thousands of undercovers that did it, you know, and it, they just had that extra click of mental toughness that they could do it. Well, let me ask you just a few more questions. One of them I need to know about the movie, whether it was true or not. Did you disappear for weeks where no one could get in touch with you and no one knew where you were? No, no. Uh, okay. I mean, I, I, I would go, you know, I may have went a, a, a couple weeks not contacting uh, my guy, but that was a relationship that I had with him, you know. And, and, and in these undercover operations, the undercover has to have a very trusting relationship with the individual that, that we call a contact agent. They have to trust each other and know what each other's goals and, and, and values are. Uh, now, he may have not heard from me in a couple of weeks, didn't know where I was because I had no surveillance in New York. Now, th- this may have upset uh, other people who, you know, when they say, hey, we're, you know, have you heard from Joe? No, I haven't. Well, when was the last time you heard from him? Well, maybe two weeks ago. Well, how come? Well, he hasn't contacted me. But you know, you know what I'm saying, right? It's, it's that trust that he had in me uh, that you know when I when I knew I had to contact him, I would. All right. So your experience with the FBI is totally different than mine. I mean, for 26 years, you know, I went into the office every day. I worked every day. I did a little mm-hmm. of those short term undercover stuff. Usually I was playing somebody's girlfriend, mm-hmm. you know, they just needed, they were going to boxing mm-hmm. match and, um, you know, I would be flown in to, to be their girlfriend. So they wouldn't have right. to be set up with a prostitute, but that was it for me. And, and I could do that because basically it was just, you know, kind of socializing with that particular agent who was undercover. Mm -hmm. Um, But other than that, you know, I came home every day. When you finished this undercover role, what was your experience? How much time did you have remaining uh, in your career? And were you able to adapt back into the, you know, the FBI with the suit going into the office with the briefcase every day? Yeah, well, it was a little different different in, in in my situation, uh, Jerry, and, and the reason being is that is that uh, once the operation was closed down, I was dealing with with now with prosecutors in in the Eastern District, the Southern District of New York, prosecutors in in uh, in Milwaukee, and uh, prosecutors in uh, in Florida, and also with. Uh, briefings at FBI headquarters. Uh, so, when know, it ended, it didn't end. It exactly, exactly. And then once uh, <clears throat> once we started trials, I mean, uh, then you know, I was uh, I, I was assigned to Quantico. I got the, but then once we started trials, you know, you're prepping for a trial, so you're in that district. And another trial, you know, I had. I had several trials going in different districts at one time. 
I was basically in, involved in the case, you know, ongoing. Mm. And then finally, when the cases ended, you know, I was instructing at Quantico. So I'd never really went out and, you know, and did a bank robbery case. You know, my whole existence then with the FBI was in the undercover field of uh, putting together the undercover school, teaching at the undercover school, instructing at, at organized crime in services or organized crime schools. I did a lot of uh, work overseas, countries that we were, you know, that we had a worker relationship with in, in the undercover field. Um, so I was kept pretty busy that way. Are you still busy that way, especially with the FBI? Does the FBI still have you come in occasionally? Well, I was uh, up until uh, two years ago, I was I was teaching at every undercover school oh. uh, uh, that the FBI was put on. I haven't done it in the last couple of years, but I'm very involved in uh, putting on schools and undercover and organized crime overseas for DOJ, and I've done some for the State Department. So I travel overseas a couple times a year for uh, for DOJ and and and, and do uh, classes on on uh, organized crime or undercover, uh, and also within in the in the U.S. for uh, local local police departments. Cool. So I'm pretty busy actually, and I got a I got a show on right now called Deep Undercover on the Escape Channel. Oh really? If anybody gets the Escape Channel, we're on at uh, at ten o'clock East Coast time every Wednesday, and it's called Deep Undercover. And what it is, every episode is we feature uh, an undercover case and interview the undercover agent. Oh, cool! Yeah, very so cool. You, you get the Escape Channel uh, Wednesdays at ten o'clock. All right, so. And I haven't asked you a lot about the actual undercover case because there's so many books and mm-hmm. there's, you know, there's uh, um, documentaries and videos and things right. like that. And I figure people can go and watch that. And actually, everything that you've ever written, uh, written, I have links on this episode's show notes so they can go right to your nonfiction books. So oh, thank you. Thank right. You. So here's my last question, because this was fascinating to me. You know, what what I'm doing now is working full-time as a crime fiction author. And I know Mm -hmm. there's a few other agents. Most agents, when they write, they're writing nonfiction books about their cases. And there's a few of us that have now started doing crime fiction. And uh, John Legata has his book out. Mm -hmm. um, And um, there's a Dana uh, Reidenauer has a book out. So there's a few of us and myself. I was shocked. I had no idea that you've actually written four crime novel for uh, crime and three uh, right none yeah yeah in so fact tell, I'm, I'm writing another one right now <laughs> so tell us about that because that's totally different to me and i, I I'm, I'm sure somebody who's writing nonfiction is going to be upset that i said this but to me writing nonfiction, you know is a lot easier but when you write a crime novel when you write a crime a, a novel there's really, you know, there's a method that you have to use to capture your readers and to, mm-hmm. to make it interesting. And, and you have to be willing to um, go beyond, you know, use creative license to add a little juice to things. Um, how did you learn how to do that? And, and what made you interested in writing those crime novels? Well, you know, you only can write so much non nonfiction about what you've done. The fiction, a lot of it, of course, is told from personal experience. But when you put it in a fiction type setting, a fiction novel, you can expand on it and go either way you want to go. Uh, because, as you know, a, a lot of a lot of the stuff is cut and dry. You know, uh, the, the nonfiction stuff is cut and dry. You know, this happened, this happened, this happened. Uh, so what I what I do is I I take the real events and then just ex, you know take them to where I I think the audience want wants to go with them or you know and where they their mind would 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 like it to go. Uh, you can do a lot more with it 
like now I'm uh, I'm in the process of, uh, of writing uh, fiction about uh, when when uh, Donnie Brasco now is out of the bureau uh, and they're they're trying to bring him back to you know to do something. And you know when I, I was w- working on you know, getting ready for our interview um, over the weekend, that's when I found out about your your crime novels. Part of the thing that I that I do on the podcast is I read crime fiction and, and have a recommendation. But mm-hmm. I'm going to try to get I'm going to try to get that first novel in your series and, and do some speed reading so that I can introduce it to the listeners. But your series is the character's name is Donnie Brasco, so you took right, that. That's correct. Yeah. yeah. Oh, that is so cool. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I love writing crime fiction. Um, I'm supposed to be working on my second book now. Uh, the first one's doing very well. It just came out in September. Great. But I'm spending so much time on the podcast that I think that I, <laughs> I, I got to make sure that, uh, you know, I, I start focusing more on the second novel. But I was just thrilled. I was absolutely thrilled to see that you had um, written some crime novels, and I can't wait to start re- reading them. Wow. So, so, so those are all listed too. Show, show notes for uh, this episode. If, you know, people were to go to my website, Jerry, jerrywilliams.com. I'll have all of the nonfiction books that you've written and the crime novels that you've written, so they can just uh, go right to those links and uh, check them out. Well, thank you. I appreciate it, yeah. and I appreciate the uh, the chance to. Uh, to do this uh, conversation with you it was uh it was very uh, pleasant and enlightening on my part all right is there anything that i missed is there any anything that you want to to say that kind of wraps this up no, i think you pretty much uh you, you pretty much uh covered everything uh just just thank you okay <laughs> thank you very, very much no, thank you. I mean, I know you're going to hate that I say this, but you are FBI royalty, and you don't know yeah. how absolutely thrilled I am to have this opportunity to talk to you. My husband, you know, because he's from, you know, South Jersey, and he's uh-huh. always been fascinated with the mob. When I told him that I was going to be interviewing you, his mouth flew open. Uh, you know, he knows all about you, so... You know, my husband likes me anyway, but now he's looking at me. <laughs> now, now it's extra. <laughs> yeah, now he's thinking like, God, oh, this podcast thing that she's doing is taking so much of her time. It's uh-huh. paying off uh-huh. in some ways, you know? So, yeah, it's so Well, cool. that's good. Thank you, Joe. No, thank you. I appreciate it. It's my okay. pleasure. And that's the end of the interview. As always, back at jerrywilliams.com, you'll see a photo of Joe. He's still incognito. He has on sunglasses and a hat. There's also links to a fantastic documentary on Joe where he talks more about his undercover exploits. And there are links to all of his books, the three nonfiction and the four crime novels, which I'm still so excited about. If you enjoyed the episode, please share it with all of your friends and family and associates. I make it easy for you. At the bottom of the episode's show notes, you'll find all the social media share buttons. My crime fiction recommendation for today is Joe's novel, Donnie Brasco, Deep Cover. I did not get a chance to finish it, but I'm telling you from the chapters that I have been able to read, it's fantastic. One of the things that I noticed that he did in this book, again, he is his character is Donnie Brasco, and he follows the same scenario of going undercover with the mob. But there's a lot more emotion involved in it. This Donnie Brasco talks about being under stress, being emotional, being lonely. And although Joe Pistone tells us it's fiction, and I'm using air quotes, it's giving us an insight into his feelings and emotions experienced during his undercover days. So my crime fiction recommendation for today is Donnie Brasco, Deep Cover. And while you're on Amazon downloading Joe Pistone's ebook, if you haven't already, please consider also downloading a copy of my crime novel, Pay to Play. 
I just want to remind you that my time and the cost of producing these podcast episodes is supported by those of you who have purchased Pay to Play. And I want to thank you for your support of the podcast and of my crime novel. Don't forget that I have the 2017 FBI G-Man collectible calendar for you. The other day, I got glossy brochure paper. I printed out several copies of the calendar. I took it to the local office supply store. They put holes in the top and I took a spiral coil and threaded it through and voila, holiday gifts for my FBI friends. That file is available for you to download on my website, jerrywilliams.com. This episode was sponsored by fbiretired.com, the only online directory made available to the general public featuring retired FBI agents and analysts interested in showcasing their skills to secure business opportunities. I want to thank you for listening, and I hope you come back again for another episode of FBI Retired Case File Review with Jerry Williams. Thank you.